Hello, everyone, and welcome to Resilience Untangled Challenges and Opportunities in Latin America. Thank you all for joining us here today for the first ever collaborative conference organized by Latinx groups at Penn's Weizmann School of Design, MIT DUSP, Columbia GSAP, and Harvard's GSD. We wanted to come together as a group to discuss and highlight work done across design disciplines, specifically in Latin America and the Caribbean. We've, we've really enjoyed getting to know each other and hope to continue the traditions in years to come, uh, hopefully in person. So today we'll hear from academics, practitioners, students, and communities about topics um, with resilience in these regions. Resilience, the capacity to recover quickly has emerged as a guiding principle for development at the global level, thus shaping the futures socially, economically, and environmentally. We hope to advance the conversation about resilience from the perspective of various backgrounds and to experience um, and experiences to better understand this concept from the lens of work in Latin America and the Caribbean. First up, we have a panel featuring esteemed professors from each institution involved in organizing this event today. Members of the panel will discuss the meaning and importance of resilience moving forward and the evolution of the term. So now I'd like to introduce the moderator for this panel, Nora Libertun de Duren. She is a senior specialist in the urban development and housing sector of the Inter-American Development Bank. Nora holds a PhD in urban planning from MIT, a master's degree in urban design from Harvard University, and a master's degree in architecture from the University of Buenos Aires. Previously, she has been the director of urban planning for the city of New York and has taught urban planning and urban design at Columbia University, MIT, and Harvard University. Nora's analytical work focuses on urban sustainability, housing policies, and public space in Latin American cities. Her articles have been published in prestigious academic journals, including Cities, Urban Studies, Housing Policy Debate, International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, International Journal of Housing Policy, Journal of Planning, Education and Research, and City and Community, among others. So without further ado, I will now pass it on to Nora to introduce our panelists and to begin the introductory session of this conference. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the introduction. Before I begin, I just want to congratulate the organization and, and all the students who participate in this initiative. I think it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful that you are working as a community of colleagues and scholars and thinkers and practitioners trying to, to advance the most important questions of our time. And, and also, you know, to have this idea of focusing on a region in particular, I think it's very valuable and it's something that I have not seen before. So I just want to congratulate you a lot for that. Um, I am humbled by this panel. I think that I feel, as I, as I said to them, I feel like I'm in, you know, like in an, Oscar ceremony or something like that, you know, they are all the, you know, the best of the best. So, so it's really an honor to, to be moderating this panel. I will first uh, give, you know, a very um, brief view of each of them, brief because, you know, anything I'll say will be brief comparing to what I could say about them. And then I will just introduce the, the main topics for this session and, and pass them to each of them to present their own perspective on that. So I will read um, just not to, to miss anything, but please understand that their achievements are much more than what I'm going to read. So Larry Bale is Associate Dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning, fourth professor of urban design and planning and director of MIT's Resilient Cities Housing Initiative. Larry is the author or, or editor of 12 books and more than 60 articles examining urban design, affordable housing, and city planning, including four prize-winning volumes on American public housing history, design, policy, and politics. More globally, he is best known for two other books, Architecture, Power, and National Identity, which is an analysis of design capital cities, and a co-edited volume, The Resilient City. At MIT, Larry has won the Institute's highest award for teaching and for graduate student advising, as well as departmental awards for advising and service to students. Thank you for being here, Larry. Kate Orff is the founder of SCAPE and a professor at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. 
She is the director of the Urban Design Program and faculty director of the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscape. SCAPE is an award-winning 60-person professional practice based in Lower Manhattan, New York, where she directs the design of all projects. As a professor and practicing professional, she has advanced concepts of sustainable planning and urban design at multiple scales. Thank you, Kate. Um, I don't see you here now, but I'm sure you're here. <laughs> okay. Diane, oh, okay, hi. <laughs> Diane Davis is the Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Before moving to the GSD in 2011, she served as the head of the International Development Group in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the MIT, where she also had a term as Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. She is trained as an urban sociologist and her research interests include the relations between urbanization and national development urban governance, informality, and the growth and structure of cities with a special emphasis on Latin America. Hello, Diane. And then we have Jeannie Bird, who is the Lawrence C. Nussdorf Chair of Urban Research and Education. She teaches courses in global urbanization and the doctoral seminar and serves as a chair at the graduate group in city and regional planning and co-directs at the Penn Institute for Urban Research. She is president of General Assembly of Partners, the engagement platform for the implementation of the UN's new urban agenda and associated global agreements. She co-chairs the Sustainable Development Solution Network thematic group on cities, and she is an associate editor at the Journal of the American Planning Association. Hello, Jenny. Again, this is very impressive. This is like a, you know, like a stellar, stellar. <laughs> <laughs> a stellar cast and I'm really you know, happy to be here with you. So I will tell you a little bit about what I asked from them before I, you know, I, I pass the, the, the word for them and, and I will follow the same order in which I present each of them. So we start with, Laura, with Larry, then Kate, then Diane, and then Jeannie. So when I was reviewing um, this idea of resilience, which I think is quite complex, it came to me the, the question that we all have, which is, what is this? What are we talking about? And then I did my own little research on the concept in Latin America, what, what was the main conversation? And basically there were three things where the, the issue of urban informality and how it affects uh, specific communities and, and how the environment affects them in particular we have the issue of urban planning and we have the issue of governance. So, so my first question to myself is what's new? I mean, like this is the same thing that we've been talking about in Latin American cities for the last 30 years, if not more. So, so I was wondering if resilience was a new word, a new, a new vessel to speak about all issues. And, and then, that's why I posed these three questions to, to these distinguished panel members. So the first thing I asked was how they define resilience, like how do they understand this word? The second thing I asked from them is how this definition changed, particularly in the last five years, if it has changed, because as we all know, these last five years have been particularly challenging in terms of our, our um, common quest as a society in terms of what do we want and which are the main problems and you know both in terms of inclusion social inclusion as well as the environment so I was curious you know if there's something that has changed in this, this last this last five years and also um, with this concern in my mind that we keep on facing the same issues over and over again, particularly in Latin America it's hard to see progress in some in some issues what we should start doing now to achieve this vision of, of resilience, what, which are the main things that we need to start doing. And by doing, I mean like thinking or talking or teaching or, or, or you know, designing, what should we do? So without further ado, I want to, to invite Larry to provide his, his input, his insights on, on these issues. Welcome, Larry. Thank you so much, uh, Nora. It's it's a pleasure to see all of you, and uh, and a, a great honor to be with this panel. Um, I'm going to share a screen and try and um, 
respond. Um, let's see, that didn't seem to do it. It says I'm screen sharing. Um, let's just get rid of my calendar. That looks like something that's getting close. So Nora asked us, I think, really helpfully to state our definition of resilience and then reflect on how our thinking has evolved and to consider what is needed next to achieve a definition of, of resilient. And for me, this is really expressed by the need to move from something that we really all too easily call the resilient city uh, to something that I think is uh, more consequential, uh, a notion of an equitably resilient city. So if one is going to take the distributional politics of resilience seriously, it becomes possible to arrive, I think, at a more holistic definition of equitably resilient urban settlements. So for me, uh, equitably resilient settlements result when there is something that's seen as a legitimate process that will not just in will merge environmentally protective infrastructure, care about an attractive built environment, but also ensure that it's promoting habitation that will benefit everyone, including the least advantaged. And all too often in Latin America and elsewhere, projects that are touted as promoting something called resilience often fall short in the key political dimensions of legitimacy and equity. So what I'm hoping is that the effort to document equitable resilience can identify and promote some more promising alternative cases. Nora asked if our definition has changed in the last uh, five years or so. Uh, and for me, the answer has been fairly consistent for about eight years, uh, ever since the launching of the Resilient Cities Housing Initiative, or Archie, at MIT in 2013. The main difference for me is that we've been attempting to operationalize that definition by seeking out ambitious projects and programs that really try to improve human settlements in holistic ways. So my window into resilience has focused on housing, uh, but recognizing that that's not enough to build or rebuild housing to that's simply affordable. If you're going to be concerned about the overall resilience of a city, housing has to uh, introduce what I think of as four principles. It can't be equitably resilient unless it's going to help residents cope with other simultaneous challenges, economic struggle, a changing climate, dysfunctional governance, and urban violence and unstable tenure. So we give these a shorthand of livelihood, environment, governance, and security. And housing in Latin America and elsewhere needs to be cited with access to jobs. It needs to be designed and located in less risky areas. It needs to involve residents in community management. And it needs to protect the security of residents, both from violence and from displacement. Uh, we found that few projects succeed in doing all of this, but substantial progress on any of these seems worthy of praise. One of the more promising examples we've been studying is already quite well known, uh, the Caño Martin Peña Community Land Trust in San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, Caribbean, but not quite Latin America, uh, launched uh, between 2002 and 2004. It's uh, substantially controlled by the residents of eight informal communities along the Martin Peña Channel, uh, which was a highly polluted tidal estuary reaching near the city center. The land in the area was mostly government owned and, and the government wanted to clean up the channel, but the residents correctly feared displacement and gentrification if this happened. 1500 low to moderate income residents became members of the Channel Land Trust, which owns and manages 110 hectare, hectares, I think it's about 272 acres. This provides uh, in, permanently in for affordable housing, as well as alternative housing for those who had to be displaced by the dredging. They created a government corporation and LACE to implement the project and regularized uh, land tenure uh, and uh, also created uh, improved public space and a variety of socioeconomic initiatives. Uh, in the words of a two, 2020 assessment, 
Resident participation turned an engineering project unaware of its negative externalities into a comprehensive development project taking action to prevent such externalities. And this led to creation of public policy and institutions to make it feasible. Uh, it's been discussed uh, in two chapters in the recently published book on common ground. It won a UN World Habitat Award in 2016, and it's now actively seen as a model for favela uh, redevelopment in Brazil, among other places. Uh, so, so lastly, what do we need to do now to achieve this vision of resiliency? It, it seems to me that equitably resilient urbanism results when there's an enthusiastic yes not just to my two first questions about environmental protection or even attractive public space that seem up till now mostly the focus of, of projects, but also the latter two questions focused on the equity, the equity and the legitimacy of proposals. So for me, it's, it's difficult but not impossible to do this, and we should be collecting and touting more examples of successful efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, for, for this presentation. I just want to say that at the end, we'll have time to discuss you know, these four presentations and open up for questions for, from the audience. So Kate, I don't know if you're ready to follow. Yes, I am. Is that working? <laughs> Great, so um, thanks. Larry, I'm happy also to be part of this panel, and I love seeing the collaboration among institutions. I'm working on something called the Green New Deal Super Studio now, which also has a similar collaborative spirit, and it's really the way we all need to be working and thinking and uh, together in the future. Um, I tried to take your prompt quite quite literally, Nora, in terms of you know the way I used to think or the way I'm thinking now. Um, I, I, I will say I used to think about uh, resilience as a sort of a built environment challenge that we need to think in dif differently and build differently in our physical landscape. Uh, but more and more, I think about it as the top two aspects. One, which is <laughs> reducing carbon now, and that truly is the systemic, uh, one of the kind of core systemic problems that that's a root at the root of the issue in terms of you're talking about climate resilience. And then two, that I, I feel more and more like these issues are issues of human rights and that the frame of, of justice somehow needs to, to change to adapt to a human rights perspective. And that uh, it's often people in harm's way that are the least empowered and have the least access to infrastructure are, are those that uh, are required by us to be deemed resilient. <laughs> so, um, and then moreover, I guess, you know, as, as from, from many years and, and into the future, I do still think and try to advance the concept of concepts embedded in landscape as templates for resilience thinking and acting. So I've learned quite a bit um, uh, from the New York environment. Uh, and I think as a landscape architect and someone who's sort of pulling permits <laughs> for uh, resilient projects, do think I have a, a, a kind of an eye on the ground in terms of you know, the need for uh, incredibly robust physical landscapes with intact shorelines, with uh, 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 thriving wetlands, with coral reefs uh, intact, etc. These are the kinds of physical environments that I think clean water, etc., that characterize resilient cities. And I think empowered uh, communities uh, is also a, a deep kind of characterization of, of resilient cities. So we've had a lesson here in New York uh, around learning from the past, learning from the physical landscape, understanding the protective benefits of wetlands, shallow water landscapes, dunes, uh, uh, sedimented, uh, replenished sediment, etc., and the protective benefit of intact landscape ecosystems, i.e. an ecosystem as infrastructure uh, approach. Unfortunately, these ecosystems, not only in the United States, but uh, probably all around Latin America, in my experience visiting and uh, working in several uh, locales, have been uh, 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 taken and have been uh, uh, diminished. So uh, part of what, at least in our practice at SCAPE, I've been trying to do is weave together not just a kind of a definition of resilience, but to try to advance a resilient stance 
uh, and you know that goes beyond just best practices of planning or urban design to sort of primal gate uh, culture onshore that has uh, aware of risks and environmental risks to you know promote uh, landscape projects that rebuild ecosystems and that uh, together that this is a sort of a, a whirl, if you will, uh, that kind of reverses this trend of uh, uh, degradation of the environment and disempowerment of communities and increasingly at risk. So we have to reset this world here. I've learned quite a lot personally from the Jamaica Bay landscape, which was pictured earlier uh, in the sense that this has been a federal project to replenish disappearing wetlands. It's also been an incredibly local project that involves community action and community activities that is uh, paid and, uh, and part of school projects, et cetera. And it's really this uh, kind of framework, I think, that has a lot of power that could potentially also sort of be applied or interpreted in the Latin uh, context. Our project, which is this Living Breakwaters project that's in construction uh, in July, is uh, also something that tests a resilience physical project that integrates all three of these aspects of risk reduction, uh, ecological rebuilding, uh, and uh, rebuilding kind of onshore culture. And so uh, that's underway now. And, uh, you know, I do feel like it has a lot of potential for um, not just thinking about resilience as like a planning mode, but something that is uh, in, invests in uh, people and uh, people and, 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 and sort of reconnects uh, in, in a direct way, uh, a, a kind of a stewardship framework. In the Columbia context, I've taken students all over the world and have really put water at, at the center of the resilience narrative. Uh, this is students in, uh, with, with, in Pune, India, and this is a range of, of cities that we've been to in the past, say, six, seven years, uh, uh, all of which are incredibly unique and different, but that share qualities of becoming, having populations that are more and more vulnerable, uh, and that uh, uh, that are, be, are developing along a kind of a petrochemical urbanization mode, and that are uh, not uh, are becoming more and more vulnerable, and less resilient. Um, and so uh, that sort of framework has talked, you know, tried to explore the way that we plan and design for water is a matter of life and death for our planet, and truly is a kind of a foundation of uh, what it means to be healthy and resilient. So particularly in the Latin context, I'm uh, from if we want to talk about the range of mangroves uh, on the coast of Colombia or uh, the reefs pr pr protecting uh, Belize city and uh, uh, the wetlands of the uh, uh, in, in uh, Uruguay or in Montevideo, you'll, you'll hear about that later, but all of these um, ecological landscapes have a huge role to play uh, as do the people uh, that live in them. So I think that's a, a couple of big picture lessons uh, that I hope we can, that apply to many contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. We'll come back again uh, at the end of, of the four presentations and we now follow with Diane. Diane, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Let's see. Is my screen shared? No. Yes. It is? Okay. I'm so bad on these things. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, just a, thanks for including me in this. It's such a great panel. I know we all are going to want to talk to each other for much longer than we possibly have time for, but let me just say I'm happy that I'm following Kate. Um, I mean, the ordering with Larry, whose work kind of looks at both climate as well as kind of you mentioned violence in your introduction. Larry, I just want to get a caveat that my response to Nora's great questions have to do with my own work on questions of resilience as seen through the lens of looking at violence in Latin America or across the, across the global south. And when I was at MIT, I um, developed a project with a group of students that looked at what we called urban resilience in situations of chronic violence. I do think, as you'll see in a second, that the questions that I'm raising about resilience have a lot to do with uh, looking at violence, but they're going to be um, hopefully relevant to looking at climate change and other forms of vulnerability. Uh, and just as a little side note, at the GSD, I've been co-directing a master in design studies program in risk and resilience, where we're really trying to engage conceptually and analytically in um, 
kind of the parallels, what, what we can learn, those who are studying environment can learn from those who are studying violence and vice versa, because they're two different forms of vulnerability. So in answer, my uh, in response to um, Nora's question about how I define resilience, I want to first say, and I've written about this, and many of you who taking classes with me know this about me, I'm not that a big fan. <laughs> That, and I have not been that big of a fan of the concept of resilience. So what I did in this slide here is I want to under I want to first of all highlight what I see as the limitations of the concept. Again, drawn from my work on violence, but you know resilience, which is often like summarized as thinking about coping and adaptation strategies. First of all, that the kind of as I would say the kind of under the epistemological underpinnings of the notion are ones that I think we have to question because it does not assume a capacity to directly eliminate the root causes of the vulnerabilities. And in my understanding of Mills, it's kind of like, okay, there's a structural problem and let's see how we can tinker around the margins. I'm not saying everybody who used the concept of resilience when they looked at violence were doing that, but in my own work on violence, I mean, this is a major problem, just like climate change, even probably more complex, with a variety of global scales from the local to the planetary that produce violence, I mean, excuse me, that pr produce climate change. But violence is also the same type of a problem. It's not easily managed with interventions, spatial and otherwise. So that's the first problem with the notion of, of resilience. The second one is constantly people say, well, resilience is about bouncing back or returning to normalcy. But in the context of violence, the, the violence is a product of the fact that people are living in terrible situations. So the thought that you would want to introduce policies to return to normalcy to me is, is ridiculous, or shall I say conceptually flawed. Third thing that I want to say that we developed, and I think it's one of the best things that came out of our project on violence in Latin America is we we developed the notion, we wanted to disaggregate the concept of resilience. We had to work with that concept, but let me just say, because we got funding from USAID, which was under Hillary Clinton at the time, and resilience was a big branding concept that they were using to fund you know, international relations. So we had to kind of take seriously resilience, but what we did is we proposed a distinction between what we call positive resilience, negative resilience, and equilibrium resilience with positive resilience being coping and adaptation strategies that might forge a pathway out of the structural problems of violence. Negative resilience being the fact that in the real world, people undertake direct coping and adaptation strategies at a certain moment in their certain context that can drive the root causes of violence, that would empower the perpetrators of a violence because that's how they can survive. So, and then the third concept was um, equilibrium, which most people live in, which is you kind of, things don't get that much better, but they don't get that much worse. So maybe we can talk about how relevant those distinctions are for looking at climate change problems. Two things really quickly, I only have three slides and the next are gonna go quickly. I just wanted to say that in our research, we looked at deep histories, we had eight case studies to understand the socio-cultural and socio-structural and socio-spatial context of violence. In other words, it wasn't a technical exercise. We were kind of trying to un, kind of un, reveal the historical origins of, of violence and understand what can be done in that particular structure, the structural context. So that led us to obviously the work that I've been doing at the GSD. Is I don't focus on resilience anymore. I focus only on risk because I think that we are living in a world at risk. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we are trying to do something about it and kind of have all the positive attributes that people identify with resilience, but that we're really focusing on risk. Now, second, now how do I move my slide? Um, does any, I have this on my, oh, there. Um, the second qu uh, slide, quickly, Nora asked us to think about how our de definition of resilience is different now than in the past. Since I never liked the definition of resilience in the first place, what I wanted to do is kind of morph that question into a question about time and temporality. Not so much whether I myself have changed the way I define resilience, but having us think a little bit about the power of the concept of time and where that should factor into our studying 
uh, both vulnerabilities, climate, violence, and how to deal with it. So, and I'm not gonna say much more than the fact that in our research that we found that the measurement of resilience or the measurement of what looked like it was working had a temporal dimension. Because you could take a snapshot of something at one moment and it didn't really accurately reflect a larger, the larger scheme of change. And in fact, at one moment, we found, for example, on the issues of, of violence, that their kind of data analysis showed that homicides were going down, but homicides were going down because there was a new relationship between the perpetrators of violence and citizens that reinforced negative resilience. In other words, the data showed that things looked like they were getting better and they were really getting worse. And there was a temporality to that. So that's kind of the point about thinking about when we look at at action and when we assess whether the actions that we're undertaking are working or not, we have to be very attuned to temporality. Um, and I think that also for me suggests that again, in the study of violence, that we need new methods of analysis and action that are not just like formal quantitative metrics. The other thing that I think comes across on this slide is that we looked at the, hi the history of violence has a lot to do with what's possible and what's not, the point I made earlier. And the second thing is that the violence, there was a co-production of kind of conditions of vulnerability depending on the conflation of various sectors. So we might think about that in the contemporary um, era of looking at violence in Latin America, the ways in which, well, in, in this slide, I mean, we look at resources, urbanization, drugs, economic, there are all sorts of sectors that explain this larger vulnerability. In the contemporary period, I'm very interested in the conflation or the kind of co-production of, of climate change issues and violence because climate change brings climate migrants often in neighborhoods or countries where violence is already high and that kind of intensifies both climate uh, climate migration as well as violence. Oops, and there's my last one, uh, just the last one. And I won't say much more about this because I think this is where I'm totally with Larry and Kate that like about, well, what do we do about these problems now? Obviously, we want to connect them to equity and social justice commitments. And Larry did a great job of laying that out. But the second thing that I wanted to put on the table here is, well, when we look at, it's important to look at governance and not just space and look at social relationships and history. And like, we want to look at the overlapping sectors and that sweet side of how they produce really bad vulnerabilities and whether, whether in order to untangle that, we have to have like a multiple actions at these three scales simultaneously. That's one point. And the second one that I'm working on now is thinking a little bit more, and this is maybe to speak to the institutional, the appropriate sovereignties to enable preemptive action. And when I say sovereignty, I'm thinking about Oh, I would like to use the Benedict Anderson concept of imagined community. So not just formal political territorial governance strategies, but what is the kind of the political ecology or the political territoriality of sovereignty? Who's involved? Maybe we could think about Latour's concept of the critical zone. Who should be involved in certain types of vulnerabilities, whether it's violence or climate change, it may move beyond a political territory of governance, but that we have to rethink those sovereignty arrangements if we are going to um, support preemptive, preemptive action about um, um, vulnerability. So I'll stop there, thanks. Now, am I off? Yeah, stop here, sorry. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so yeah. much. And um, as I said, we'll come back at the end and also we will provide time for questions and, and answers. And, and then Jeannie, last but not least, I, we're looking forward to you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, students and faculty for organizing this wonderful conference and this very provocative set of um, introductory uh, talks that we have. Um, I'm going to be a lot more simplistic in terms of thinking about resilience and um, of course agree with everything that has come before me, but uh, to boil it down to a very simple set of thoughts, I think it's the ability to provide uh, for the needs of all citizens to work, live and play in places that are peaceful, prosperous and environmentally safe. It's fairly simple and fairly basic. Uh, and that 
and when you talk about Latin America, I think the primary issue that has to be dealt with, which Nora addressed in the beginning, was this issue of informality. Uh, with 60% of the population in Latin America working in formal jobs, uh, 30 to 40% of uh, populations living in informal settlements, it's time to think about how to address informality with real seriousness. Um, in terms of how I used to think about resilience, obviously there were priorities that were set within that. I think we have all changed our priorities now in terms of what needs to be done first. Uh, obviously the health issue has come to the fore and we need to be thinking about that above all things. Uh, we need to be of course thinking about poverty because when we're talking about a green and just uh, recovery after COVID-19, uh, one of the biggest issues is the vulnerabilities that exposed and the issues with regard to poverty. So that leads us to thinking about how jobs are created, how education is supported, and um, how the basic physical environment that our speakers before us have addressed um, those particular issues, whether it's dealing with housing or dealing with climate change or whatever, but we need to deal with the global issues as well in order to meet my simple definition of, of, of resilience. And that brings me to uh, how are we going to do this? And it's all about money. And I think we need to be thinking a little bit more about money and how the structure of how funding has occurred uh, is occurring in the development arena today. Um, my work has been focusing on how we finance uh, climate resilient uh, infrastructure. And let me just share this slide, just a second. Um, and one of the things that um, I've been dealing with obviously is how one understands what the financial system is in terms of to get that money into the areas that we want to get it to. All of these things that uh, we've talked about, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, dealing with our, our, our shorelines, whether it's dealing with violence and so forth, is going to take a lot of funding to do so. And the first thing we have to understand is that we have a finance system uh, that is based on 20th century ideas. Uh, it is based on the agreements that were made after World War II to promote peace and security, uh, to uh, give uh, a precedence to nations rather than cities. And uh, cities are not part of this discussion, uh, particularly when it comes to making the decisions of the great international funding organizations, whether it be the World Bank or the IDB or whatever, it's very difficult to get a city voice there. In fact, a city can't borrow money directly without an international uh, a guarantee for obvious reasons, but nonetheless, difficulties arise when um, there are political realities when national governments don't agree with local governments and therefore, how are you going to uh, do this sort of thing? Um, to their credit, the international financial institutions are doing a lot of things to address these issues so they can work within their mandates. Um, for example, the World Bank has created programs to help with the uh, credit worthiness of cities so that cities can create their own revenues to uh, support some of the changes that we want for resilience. Uh, they have special uh, city focused activities, urbanization reviews and so forth. The IDB has its uh, uh, innovation labs. Uh, we can talk about lots of things that are happening, but what we really need to be thinking about is how we can start um, finding ways for cities to direct their own resilience within their the national goals that, that are held. And that means finding ways for them to become credit worthy. It means finding ways for these large informal populations to be integrated into the formal economy so that we can create the kinds of fundraising that you need to do within a, a city itself. It means uh, finding ways for um, education and capacity building for localities so that they can create the kinds of projects that can be fundable through existing and new institutions. And so for me, resilience means finding a way to do this. And this brings us back, of course, to governance, which Diane was talking about as she uh, finished her talk and the necessity of expanding the number of stakeholders that are involved in the decision-making that's occurring. Because if we're going to create resilience, it has to be created with a collaborative approach to the kinds of solutions that those wonderful solutions that we've heard being presented here today. And that means expanding civil society. It means giving local governments a voice at the table and so forth. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeannie. And um, this has been, you know, wonderful. And I just want to do some, to highlight some things, some commonalities and some differences, and then open up to questions. So the good, the good news is like, after listening to all of you, we can work together. You know, there is so much in common and there are so many entry points that are complementing to each other that I think, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Like you, like Jenny came at the, at the end and said like, I agree with everything else. <laughs> and you said something totally different, which I think it's, it's powerful in itself. So what I found is that all of you ended with an idea that we can do something about this. And I appreciate that a lot. The, the, the message was there is something to be done. There's something that can be improved and there are examples of improvement. So I think that's also very powerful. Um, I also want to highlight that, and it's no wonder that the notion of resilience, even if it's contested as in the case of Diane, it always includes uh, people and places and institutions. Um, and then in terms of, of differences, something that called my attention is that some of you were focusing on products and some of you were focusing on processes. Uh, I think that Larry was focusing more on a product and Kate as well, and Diane and Jeannie were more talking about processes of doing things, even though, of course, everything is you know, connected and we know it's a loop in which we are learning, but that was there. And also the other thing that called my attention are the scales, the, the, the scales and the entry points. And I think that we kind of cover the whole range, like from the architecture to the landscape, to the society, to the institutions. And I think that that, that is wonderful because it does provide many entry points to, to work on this. And also some other thing that I want to highlight that it seems to me that the utopian notion of resilience is a society that doesn't exist with a landscape that used to be somewhere a thousand years ago. So, so it seems that you know it's it's a future of a society that we don't know yet, that we have never experienced where everything you know is perfectly fair and just with the landscape that you know maybe maybe we never lived there yet, but it was somewhere in our far, far past. So I want to, to do something now, which is open the q and I think it's open, it's available to all of us to read. And then try, I will try to assign um, questions to all of you. But before that, I just wanted to, to take advantage of this opportunity in case there is some you know, observation or some insight that Larry, Diane, Kate, or Jeannie want to, to say now after listening to all of you, you know, before we jump into the questions, you know, just, just something brief because we don't have so much time, but I, I want to allow that. Yes, Jeannie. As I think back on just what the 20 minutes that just happened, and we're all talking about resilience, but everyone has a specialty uh, and a focus. And it's bringing these foci together in a collaborative situation that's so important. Um, because we can't have resilience unless we have so many different components. I, agree. I think it's also on us to problematize resilience. I mean, I see this sort of, con you know, the words, the, the questions in the Q&A about, you know, how has the framework of resilience started to become more, more dominant in the discourse personally on the, on the ground in terms of working with mayors or governors, even in the United States and in red states or in, in conservative states where you're not allowed to say the words climate change. Uh, everybody wants resilience work and resilience projects. So I don't know, I also just feel like it might be interesting to talk about that term a little bit more because as much as it's challenged by all and, and to, to Jeannie's point, like each, each, each perspective is kind of problematizing it in a different way. We still uh, come back to it as a kind of a notion of what a path forward might look like that has, you know, not a, a you know, a, de a degraded physical environment that has more, you know, characteristics of just and good cities. And <laughs> so, I mean, I, I would be interested just to hear a little more on that because as much as it's constantly called into to question, it is something that municipalities, government agencies and, and others tend to rally behind relative to funding, governance, project development, et cetera. It's not just physical. 
Maybe I'd also add, I agree with all those other comments. I, I, I was thinking I didn't develop too much. It was in one of my slides, but I also think another issue, I, I don't have an answer. I have a question for the everybody on the panel, but also the students and anybody who's listening to this great initiative that, that you guys have pulled together. But I'm thinking a lot more about how do we imagine the future? So not just what to do in the future, but in order to kind of pull, to triangulate all the forces that we need to make a difference, whether it's financial, as Jeannie's mentioned, or triangulation or kind of governance, coordination across scales of governance from the planetary down to the local, we probably need a conversation about the future. And this is, I'm thinking when Kate mentions if she goes to work in the South of the United States and you can't talk about climate change, but is there a way, what can we as a profession do to use the kind of tools we have in planning, scenario planning, et cetera, to really make the, it possible to imagine alternatives in the future, the preferable ones, maybe none are perfect. And then how do we use those kinds of, um, visual and imagination tools to kind of work back to the present. I think that that's another, everybody's so focused on the here and now, which we have to be for the politics or for problem solving, but somehow or another, I think we also have to inspire people to imagine a different, well, imagine what the future, what the data says the future looks like it's going to be and imagine something different and then work, find action strategies somewhere in there. And what Diane is making clear is that it's a, a false distinction to focus on process and product, because if it's not a legitimate process, uh, it won't matter what you actually produce. And, uh, the, the only other thing I would say is I thought it was great to have the panel uh, end with Jeannie talking about a financial need. Uh, and I just assumed, Nora, you were going to have IDB pay for everything in direct response. So. Uh, maybe we maybe we just open uh, open that up and uh, and we don't even need Q and A, but I but I'd love to hear from others. Uh, well, regarding the the process and product, of course, you know, fully agree with that. I think it's it's just you know it's like the loop where you we just have to enter somewhere. And in terms of of funding, and I think that this relate relate to some of the of the questions. Um, nations are sovereign states. They are the one making the decisions on how to, how to spend funding. I mean, of course, you know, the funding is not enough, but the priorities and what to invest is, is, is their own decisions. You know, they are, they, are, they are taking the loans. So one of the, there is one question I'm going to read aloud. It says, I am curious to know what the panel thinks about who are the main diffusers or drivers of the paradigm of resilience globally and in Latin America. And I think now it goes to what Larry was saying. Is it academia, 100 DRC, states, development banks, private sector, and why? What are the motives to promote resilience instead of other paradigms, paradigms such as energy, water, food nexus? IWRM around, oh, it's, it just moved, sorry. And there, a new question enter and this moves. <laughs> Give me one second. Um, something disappeared on that question, but I think it was long enough already. So, so just to summarize, who or what are the drivers of resilience in your view? And, and I tell you, from my perspective, I don't think the banks are. I think the banks are institutions that are already too conflicted in themselves to drive anything, to be honest. Larry, would you like to start or who is there? Yeah. Uh, well, I I think you know the the advantage and the problem of resilience is that it has been adapted by a variety of political uh, perspectives and and so it it can sound like uh, a kind of neoliberal uh, we will congratulate you for figuring it out on your your own uh, kind of thing and it can also seem like a, a very state driven investment kind of opportunity and one of the problems that we have uh, is that we don't agree on on what it what it isn't. Um, and 
Uh, and if, if resilience isn't coupled with some kind of effort to include a differentially oriented beneficiary, uh, then we we don't know who is benefiting from it. And you know, so so my hope is that we can put some kind of specifications on it so that when when governments are deciding how to put their loans in uh, into play, that that everything that is done is done with a a lens that, that says who is this really benefiting and that the conversation about resilience is not separate from the conversations about inequality or informality or any of the other kinds of things, but it's seen as having distributional consequences. And, uh, and I, I think that will, will matter no matter who's in charge uh, of regulating the term. But, but people are going to have to act on it in particular ways. Otherwise, it will just mean whatever one, anyone says it means. I agree. Uh, maybe I'll jump in here. It's, I'm not sure it's exactly an answer to your question, Nora, but it's what I've thought about. And, and Larry's also put it on the table, too. Um, I, I actually want to make an argument for the, the governance, that this is a question of governance. Um, it's not, and, and it's a, a question of sovereignty, getting back to my point. I, you're exactly right, Nora, that for example, the IDB has to deal, it's, a, it's an organization, I love the way Jeannie said, we have these tools from the 20th century that are not helpful from the 20th century. We can say the same thing about governance institutions, many of them, including a place like, you know, somebody like the IDB, which has to deal with the sovereign national state. Some of my work, I'm doing some work on the pandemic and some other sets of things, but I think we really need to question the scales of sovereignty that are appropriate for dealing with the, for, with a variety of problems and the climate, climate change is one of those. And I think that um, if, we, if we kind of reimagine, we should redesign the appropriate governance institutions at whatever scale to deal with these problems. Uh, I mean, that's not a new idea, but, and we have kind of global governance organizations that are the I, ICP, you know, the climate change committees, et cetera. But somehow or another, they're not really able to push back against the national state sovereignty as kind of pushing things forward. I can't help but notice that this morning, the New York Times, there's a big article about Bolsonaro. There's global interest in having him do something, but it's like his nation, he's controlling, the Amazon for his political purposes. So what I guess I'm going to close by saying is that this is this, uh, this is about social movements that are connecting to uh, calling on existing sovereignty arrangements that we have and calling out the problems, the, their incapacity. And the last thing I would say, and I, 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 I'm fully aware that this might generate a, a, you know, a good conversation, but I've been thinking a little bit more about promoting in the context of other projects, urban sovereignty. You know, and I know that's really fraught to think in a world of planetary urbanization where a lot of people don't even believe there's such a thing as the urban, but I think a scale of sovereignty that's closer to the experience is going to mobilize a variety of actors, whether it's you know, citizens, social movements, youth groups, private sector, et cetera, bringing conditions down to a scale of everyday experience. So it's not, you know, neighborhoods too small, nation states too big. Could we think about ways in which we have associations, and I know Jeannie's work with Habitat, et cetera, it does some of this, of like cities and thinking about triangulating you know, sovereign, you know, institutions that can push and mobilize resources and forces at a scale that's not too, that's not the planet and that it's not just at the neighborhood. And I think that our discipline needs to be thinking about new institutions for doing those things. 
Uh, there are there are groups um, already, Diane, that are thinking in, in your way. In fact, there's something called UCLG, which has 240,000 government members uh, that is pushing for this very idea that you're talking about. But there are real reasons, as Nora was saying, why states are responsible for the financial piece. It's, it's their ability to operate on the capital markets and to reduce risk. Um, you, we were talking about risk earlier, and, and, and that's, that's really part of this. But to answer your question, Nora, who's driving it? There are many people driving it. This whole panel is made up of visionaries, right, who are driving it. Uh, the public sector is driving it for political reasons, just as Larry mentioned. The private sector is driving it because of um, the desire to uh, deal with risk in, in their investments. Civil society is driving it for a variety of reasons because civil society is so large and so many different groups. So there's there's the, the drivers are all over. And as many have mentioned, there's no common definition of what they're after. And so that's some of the confusion that we have. Um, Kate, I don't know if you have something to say. We have, I, I mean, it, it, it's painful to cut this panel, you know, it, it's, we could go on, <laughs> we just start yes, scratching no. it, so I, 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 I could only, I could only agree. And I mean, I kind of started off by saying in my own kind of work, I refocused on this notion of human rights in, in, in this conversation, because, you know, even the lens of, of the city as a unit, and I agree, there's a, a, a mismatch between unit of finance, unit of governance, unit of, of frankly, project. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, there's so much slippage in this, in, in this, in this, in this realm, you could think about the imperiled um, archipelagos in all over that are don't don't get covered, and that are probably made up of indigenous communities, or, or, you know, there are many examples of, of, of groups that would probably fall between the cracks in, in any kind of administrative concepts that we might uh, advance here. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do feel like in, in my own experience, it's that, that in, in any kind of resilience narrative, usually either the social falls away or the equity piece falls away. And, you know, you end up with kind of best practices or planning as usual. So I do feel like what, what I hear in all the panelists is that, that it's that, that this kind of critical aspect of, of, of social and physical and ecological and administrative governance, like there's a sort of need to, to insist that these facets are all um, present and, and don't fall away towards a, a business as usual scenario and that we truly are kind of trying to think in a, and, and envision a future. And I also, to Diane's earlier point, I also feel like that's why resilience somehow also has kept a a stronghold or, or has developed a foothold in this discussion. It's that it's somehow a future oriented term that enables an alternative uh, <laughs> vision that, that, um, that, uh, that can help rally um, action or behavior change. So thank you so much. I think that as, as you know well, we can go on forever with this topic. It's not gonna be solved, but I mean, it, it's, I think it's the beginning of the conversation. It's of course the beginning of this event, this, this long um, afternoon event. And we want to, to give time to, to the other panels coming. I, I just you know, like want to, to thank you so much for opening up, you know, starting to open up these, these questions about you know, legitimacy, something that we need to talk more about, risk, the scale in which we operate, the institutions that we need to, to think uh, to, to use and, and how are those becoming tools for our for our new vision of, of resilience and if resilience is the word even if that is the word that we should be using so thank you so much uh, it has been you know an honor being with you and i want to also thank again the students for organizing this i think it, it's it's wonderful that they are thinking about this and 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 doing this in a collaborative way and perhaps that's the best answer for our questions. That's the way to work. Like many people from many different places coming together and trying to talk about the issues. So thank you so much for all of you.